we disagree about you know what what approach we we want to take to the kind of people we are we disagree on very basic levels uh, but I think he's one of the best musicians and singer-songwriters in, in America and I've uh, have made some of the best music of my life with him, you know, and I, I would never deny that. Um, Neil, Neil is as strange as a snake suspenders. He is, uh, <laughs> he is a wonderful man. Uh, he's uh, immensely bright and immensely courageous. He has triumphed over uh, incredible difficulty personally in his life and uh, incredible adversity and done so with a grace and uh, a courage that I can only be in awe of okay and I'm not really trying to overstate the case here if anything I'm understating it uh, he's a, a tremendously prolific artist he's uh, he writes so many songs that he pisses me off I, I'm, I'm frankly jealous of him. How do you react to um, the negative critical assessments, which are by no means the consensus? But I was surprised. Before you came on, I went back and I, I picked up the Rolling Stone uh, record guide where, where they have uh, reviews of thousands of albums. And apparently some of the people who reviewed records for Rolling Stone at that time uh, viewed uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young as, uh, I think one term I, I heard was bubblegum for adults. Slick. They have done soulless. that repeatedly. They they called my first solo album mediocre, you know, and and mindless. They've they have uh, they have apparently uh, uh, never liked us and always sort of had it in for us. And frankly, we don't really give a damn. Uh, you have to very early on in your career, if you want to stay sane, realize that a reviewer or a person that writes about you. Uh, is one person. That's one ticket, one record. That's the way I look at it. They only bought one record. I don't really, I can't get too excited about them. Uh, the, the people that are the public obviously did think that we had something to say and that we were saying it well because they reacted to us like crazy. And, uh, and we have had a career of a longevity you know that that could only be explained by you know there being some quality in what we did uh, if we were as surface and you know and shallow as some of them wrote us up to be we wouldn't be here still you know we would be gone with Alice Cooper's snake you know I mean we 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 are still here you know and we're still filling you know, auditoriums, and we are still selling records, and that there is only one way you can do that, and that is by writing music that touches somebody. Teach your children well, cause their father's hell did slowly go by, and see them on your dreams, the one they fix. The one you know by the law Time coming oh, And it's been long and so it should be a song Time gone And there's so much love to make up everywhere you turn Wasted on the way So much water moving Underneath the bridge Let the water come and carry us away Let the water come and carry us away 
The top 10 reasons to start outdoor cross training. 10. Last stream you saw was on a beer. You're wondering. David had uh, a motorcycle accident and a serious <laughs> one which really banged up his left side, but uh, he'll be back dancing before very long, so that's why it's one shoe off and, yes, and one my, shoe Yes, my on. left foot really isn't that big, honest. <laughs> Boy, what a relief that is. And, and he'll be back uh, tomorrow with another installment, so what we don't cover here we'll, uh, we'll try and get to tomorrow, including some of the personal history. Am I correct in saying that only like the second or third gig that CSNN ever played was Woodstock? Second. Second one. Yep. And First there you are. Chicago Auditorium Theater. And the second one was Woodstock. Thank you. We needed that. <laughs> this is our second gig. This is the second time we've ever played in front of people, man. We're scared shitless. <laughs> How intimidated were you? What really made us nervous was that, as you say, our heroes were standing right around behind us. The band in particular, whom we were just in awe of. And, uh, uh, and you know, Airplane and Dad and Janice and Jimmy and Sly and everybody that we thought was good. Um, <clears throat> and they were all kind of going, okay, let's see it. Record was good. Let's see it. Can you do it? Come on. You know, and there was no malice, but it was like, okay, let's see it. You know, and we were going... Getting to the point where I'm no fun anymore. I'm sorry. Sometimes it hurts so badly I must cry out loud. I'm lonely. I am yours. You are mine. You are what you are, you make it hard. When, you know, somebody like Robbie Robertson or Jimi Hendrix or, you know, Grace Slick or somebody comes up to you and says, man, that was so good. You know, you go, <sighs> you know, it, was, it felt wonderful. Joni Mitchell takes a pass to appear on the Dick Cavett show. She's not at Woodstock. All true. Then you help her write the song. Well, no, she wrote it. She wrote it, and she wrote it with such accuracy and with such insight that you can only just put it, uh, you can only credit it to the, the, the genius that, uh, that she has as a songwriter, because she wasn't there. But she talked to all of us when we came back the next night, uh, and uh, she just caught it. She caught the essence of it didn't matter whether she was there or not, she nailed it. So the sense in which you helped her is not helping to compose it, but just to background her properly. We came back bubbling. I mean, you understand, it was, it was a very strange circumstance. There you have a half a million people. There were no robberies, no rapes, no murders, no fights, no big fights that I know of. Uh, that's impossible. Ask any law enforcement officer. Doesn't happen. Even at a religious gathering, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm just doesn't happen you know it was a great thing and uh, it can't be duplicated obviously if you look at Altamont it can't be duplicated at all but <laughs> you were but, there too right yeah yeah Altamont was a nightmare it was, it was the exact 180 degrees out antithesis of Woodstock why uh -huh. vibe it's a totally different vibe you know uh, different people even before the beatings took place and the guy was killed and I, I think Marty Balin got knocked out on stage by, yeah, well, by one of the Hells Marty even before those incidents Marty could you tell mistake. it was different? Marty got into an argument with the Hells Angel that, that's like saying oh please sir would you knock me out uh, the same thing goes for the rest of it. I, I was the only person who stuck up for the Hells Angels because I feel that if you don't want the tiger to eat your lunch guests you don't invite the tiger to lunch they were asked to do security that's like saying would you please come over here and hit some people but a guy got beaten to death with a pool cue, didn't he? Well, now he had a gun. You know, I think he might have gotten knifed. I'm not sure how it happened. But they're very, they were at that time extremely violent people. And they were asked to do what they thought was a violent job. 
I never did get a joyous feeling there, ever. There was always tension in the air from the moment it started. Unbelievable story uh, about you going to a party where Janis Joplin got into it with Jim Morrison. <laughs> and the part about the story, now that's interesting enough, but the part about the story that knocked me over was the party took place at John Davidson's house. I mean, couldn't you find directions to Bert Convy's house? <laughs> I mean, this is the most incongruous thing I've ever heard of. You I, guys you know, and Janis Joplin and, and Jim cannot, Morrison. I can't explain it. I know I was there. I know that's whose house it was. I know what, what happened happened. But how, why? You gotta, I'm, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. I didn't plan it. <laughs> what I, happened? Have, I'm, I don't have enough imagination to have planned something that bizarre. What happened? Um... Okay, well, now we have, this is going to be a little controversial. I, I never liked Jim Morrison uh, at all, and I never liked The Doors. I didn't like them as a band. I didn't like their music. I personally did not like Jim Morrison. I didn't like the way he behaved or, or how he, he came across. I thought he was an obnoxious person. Um, uh, but he used to get into it with people when he would get drunk. And... Uh, now, folks, you've got to understand that a tremendous number of people, way more people than me, think he was a genius and very talented and at least could credit him as being a very fine poet. Uh, I didn't, but I'm in the minority. Uh, he got into it with Janice. Uh, he used to get into it with people uh, when he was drunk, and uh, he got into it with Janice when he was the wrong person. Janice was, uh, to say it politely, not shy. Yeah. And uh, she uh, belted him with a bottle of Southern Comfort and knocked him cold. Absolutely cold. Right and on the floor. Did the party continue apace or right, they just shoved just them aside? Right on. Just went right on. Everybody was thrilled. Nice, good party. We like it. I'm just trying to imagine John Davidson walking back in. I'm not sure John was even there. I'll, I'll take Janis Joplin to block John. <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't make it. <laughs> yeah, it's, there were, I'm sure there were confrontations and combinations that were even more bizarre than that, man, that took place. But that was certainly one. As promised, David Crosby is back tomorrow night. Now, this is the uh, paperback version of his book, Long Time Gone, which has just come out. On January 16th, he went into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Birds, and we'll continue talking about Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young and some of the personal ups and downs if you join us again here tomorrow night. Until then, see you later.